Well, welcome everyone to the final program in our Postering Sharon series. I'm Gretchen Hochmeister, the Executive Director of the Hotchkiss Library. And I just wanna thank Holly Nelson, my colleague who's helping out today. Thanks so much, Holly. Um, we just ask you to please mute yourself during the presentation. If a question occurs to you while David and Darren are speaking, feel free to type it into the chat box and we will get to that later. We also will have time for Q&A where you can ask your questions in real time um, later um, in the hour. And you can use your raise hand feature then um, and we will call on you. Um, let me just briefly tell you the story of why we're here this evening, where, how we got to this point. Uh, about a year and a half ago, in July of 2021, we were moving out of 10 Upper Main Street uh, for our big renovation project that is ongoing. And we had a professional moving company that specializes in moving libraries and it took them four days to empty everything out. And on the last day, they were moving the furniture out. And there was a very large oak table upstairs in the Connecticut room, which is the room um, when you go up to the stairs on the north side to the left when you get to the top. And it was a very large old table that we think was original to the library, most likely there since 1893. And the movers had to get it downstairs and out the door. And they chose to lower it over the railing of the mezzanine space of the library down into the main nave of the library, as we call it. And um, some big strong guys were up there and they tilted it 90 degrees and lowered it over the railing to some guys who were actually standing on the old circulation desk underneath to grab it to then pass it to some guys who were standing on the floor to get it down to the ground level. And as they tipped it over and turned it 90 degrees, a very large drawer opened up, a drawer that we did not know existed. And some papers started to fall out and they grabbed them all and put them on the circulation desk for me to find when I came in. Uh, a little bit later that afternoon to see how things were going. And what we found were exactly 101 posters of all different sizes. Some were folded, some were flat, some were curled up on the edges, some had holes and were torn, some had tape on them still, and some were you know, folded and you could still read the library's name stamped on the outside and they'd never been unfolded from the mail. Um, it was really quite remarkable. So we started to ask around and figure out what we had and we knew it was pretty extraordinary. Um, we applied for and received a grant from the ALA and the National Endowment of the Humanities and that grant has allowed us to begin to research, catalog, and digitize the collection as well as conserve and frame some of them and um, eight of them are now framed and on view at the Sharon Historical Society until December 22nd. So we encourage you to go and take a look at them in person. Um, and then of course, they'll be on display in the renovated and expanded building later next year. Tonight, we have two experts on hand to shed more light on the posters, the significance of the collection and what it can tell us about our town and our country at various times in our history. The fact that both of our guests are former Sharon residents makes their participation tonight even more special, sort of a coincidence that um, they're both from Sharon or, um, or had lived in Sharon at one time. Darren Winston was the owner of the eponymous rare bookstore on the Sharon Green from 2009 to 2018 when he moved to Philadelphia with his family. And he now is the head of department for books and manuscripts at Freeman's Auction. Um, he has a weekly radio show. I'm not sure if you're all aware of that. Um, I believe it runs on Sundays on WHDD. Um, Robin Hood Radio, and it's called Darren Winston's Book Report. So please um, check that out as well. We also have David Pollock with us. He is the owner of David Pollock Vintage Posters in Wilmington, Delaware. He is one of the nation's preeminent poster collectors and dealers. He is the author of a book entitled World War II Posters, published in 2017, a visual survey of posters printed by the United States, the Allies, and the Axis, with posters from all the combatants, it looks at propaganda as a tool used by all parties in the conflict and how similar themes crossed national borders. Both David and Darren have been extremely helpful in advising me and the library about the collection. So I'm very grateful for their help and I'm so glad they're here tonight. So welcome. Thanks Gretchen. Uh, should I start or? Yes, we're gonna go chronologically. So okay. here we go, here's World War I. And they're just some highlights we selected from each of the various categories. 
David, do you want to say something about this and get us started? And we can well, let's, let's, let's go volume. back a little bit. Let's go back a little bit and just address how this collection is found and the significance. You can leave that a poster up if you want, Gretchen. Okay. The, one of the beauties of war posters, propaganda posters, is that people never throw them out. Historically, if you went to Europe on vacation and you saw a lovely travel poster, you'd bring it back and you'd get tired of it and pitch it. If you went to a movie and you like the movie, you might get the poster. But there's a patriotic element. There's our friend the Stars and Stripes, for instance, in this poster. And people wanted to preserve them. So they were given to historic societies. They were given to libraries. And while yours, fortunately, was preserved longer because it was unknown, the history of these is significant. Some of them have value in a financial sense. Other ones, which we'll get to shortly, have significance specifically Sharon-centric. So your find was both serendipitous and the fact that it was unfound was serendipitous in allowing them to preserve. Um, this by Herbert Powell is actually a very large poster and Gretchen and I spoke about it quite a while ago. I hope you'll be able to put it up. It's about five feet wide and it's a magnificent, it's an amazing piece of printing it's a stone litho, which isn't done anymore. The colors are fabulous, the conditions fabulous, and it really speaks to what was going on in World War I. Um, when we go through the posters, you'll see a very significant change between World War I and World War II. The posters of World War I, which was known as the War to End All Wars, although it unfortunately didn't do that, are much more patriotic um, and, and just reading the messages when we get into, and they were done by name artists who were hired to do posters. Uh, when we move into World War II, you'll notice they're much more militaristic and propaganda. Gretchen, by the way, thank you. That was probably the most succinct and best description in my book. What the goal is, is to explain that propaganda is just that. It's meant to deliver a message and it occurred by all parties in a conflict. And as they say, that the victors go to spoils. We can now say, well, our propaganda was good propaganda. Their propaganda was bad propaganda. But look at it with clear eyes that propaganda is propaganda. So look at all the iconography in that first poster. The flag, red, white, and blue. You know, even the words, the title to make the world a decent place to live, pretty much say it all. Um, if you want to kick to the next one. Same iconography. What are we fighting for? We're fighting for the to, to protect the goals and the women back home. Flag, red, white, and blue. The patriotism, it's fight or buy bonds. It's what you can do at home. Actually, can I jump in for a second, David? Um, Please. So when I was a very young boy, um, a neighbor of ours in North Jersey, where I grew up, had this poster in their house. And I, I mean, I was literally five or six years old. I didn't know who Howard Chandler Christie was, who's the artist. I didn't know what World War I, II or anything else was, but that I used to stare at that poster because there's so much movement between her hair and the flag. And if you look in the lower right, all the soldiers are sort of looking up and they appear to be like avoiding the flag that's in her left hand or near her left hand as though they're sort of going underneath it and every time i'd go to their house we'd sit in front of the tv that was behind the tv and i would stare at it and then at some point when i got interested in book illustration and book illustrators and artists like this i saw it again i was like there's that poster so when I saw it in your collection, I was just very happy to see it again because it really is like an old friend. And I don't know why I responded to it as I did when I was that young, but it stuck with me forever. And it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. And as David pointed out at, that, at this point, the artists were, they were illustrators and artists and they were sending one message. And as he'll describe in World War II, we now have designers, um, which is a very different thing than an illustrator. Um, but this was, not the last gasp was maybe the height of all of this. Isn't that right, David? Like when all of these guys came to get like Lion Decker and all of them and gave their all for the war effort? If we go back about 20 years, remember we had no radio, we had no TV. Magazines were the, were the communicate, mass communication method. 
and the illustrators, as you just mentioned, Lion Decker, Penfield did World War II posters, Christie, all of these guys, it's amazing, were, the, were known stars, famous in their own right, because this was the main source of communication in the period through, through World War I. Radio was coming along, but it wasn't that greatly known. Um, Howard Chandler Christie, thank you for mentioning that, the illustrator, this was known for one thing, the Christie girl, that literally was what he drew. So whether it was an advertisement, a poster for a piece of propaganda, a magazine illustration, that was his, his reason for being. The next one. Again, you mentioned Lion Decker. There's uh, Lion Decker, and there's a fabulous book about him. And he talks about how, I believe he was in Westchester County, New York, somewhere. He was so famous, he couldn't walk down the street. Years later, it would be newscasters, things like that, you know. But back then, the illustrators really were the communicators of not just pre pictures, but of the news, of history and they were highly regarded. Um, it's a fabulous illustration by Lion Decker. He and his brother were both illustrators. And again, three posters in a row, what's been in every single one of them, a flag, red, white, and blue, pure propaganda, fabulous promoting the, the ideals of America and serving the world and a war to end all wars. See if we can go four for four. Ah, there's no red, white, and blue. Joseph Pinnell was out of Boston, I believe. And among other things, he was an unbelievable illustrator who also did his own printing. Um, almost everything. I don't think I've ever seen anything by Pinnell that isn't in black and white. Just fabulous illustration and a nice poster for the library to have. I hope that they'll rotate through their 101 posters and you'll have an opportunity to see them at various times. Darren, any thoughts on Mr. Pinnell? Um, that's it's <laughs> funny you should say about uh, in color. Um, about 20 years ago, um, Swan Galleries in New York had a New York sale and everything in the auction was, it was books and posters and photography and everything related to New York. And I bought a Joseph Pinnell original illustration which has color in it. And that was one of the things that jumped out at me. It's it's very subtle color, but it's um, in New York Harbor. We were living in New York at the time. It's I thought it was lovely. It is lovely. I've always had a soft spot for him. He had a habit of making industrial looking things look beautiful, not just impressive and or scary. Like, you know, there's cranes in there. There's the ship, there's a the plane, there's smoke. It's it could look much more grim than it does, whereas I think it's um, it just makes you think there's a lot going on. Um, so I've always been a big fan, and he was uh, very prodigious. Even in his lifetime, there was volumes of uh, that I think he published and were published about his work because he was just everywhere. So this is an interesting poster. I think this is the only poster in the in the slideshow tonight that isn't the actual poster the library has. Um, the library's poster lists at the bottom the dates that she appeared and spoke. Ruth Farnham was one of the first American soldiers. She was actually a nurse and then joined up with the Serbian army and served as a, as a shooting soldier, was awarded all sorts of medals by the King of Serbia. Um, and came back to write a book, which I believe the library now has a first edition of on her experiences. And she did a tour of the United States. I, I believe it was still, 1918 was right at the end of the war. I believe it was still, while the war was still going on, talking about her experiences and again, promoting the need for the war and promoting the patriot, patriotic aspect, but rare, rare, this is, this is probably the rarest poster that they found in the collection rare woman's cause poster only on one and the the one thing i would say about it is so one of the many things that fills my time is uh loving old films and silent films and this is much to me is much more of that school like that could be 
um, any silent movie star, when you were talking about what she did, I was thinking of Gary Cooper and Sergeant York, which is, of course, much later, even though the, the, the war was the First World War, but the lighting in this, the type style, just the way it's set up with her name across the top and the information on the bottom, it could just be a movie starring someone as Sergeant Ruth Farnham. And it's, it's, and her look like you, I think you're supposed to be impressed by, um, the look in her eyes she's serious there's i presume she's standing in front of a giant flag like uh Patton. that looks like um you know uh vertical uh stripes but i i don't know what what it is but it's got a whole other patriotic look it's not a pretty young girl it's it's a woman who means business and it's it's very effective i was wondering if you could say something about how the posters were produced david in in world war one were they all lithographs like the large house poster that's a funny question because understanding the history of printing we consider posters the birth of posters about 1870 when stone lithography was first perfected in france i've seen offset lithography now, if you look through a magnifying glass, you'll see little dots, yellow cyan and magenta black, and that's what's called an offset print um, or process color. I've seen process color as 1898. I've seen stone lithography as late as the 60s. So you cannot rely on the printing process to date a poster. Um, most of the World War I posters are right in the, in the crossover and I, I if i had to guess i'd say it's probably 50 50 offset and lithography but but it's right at the right at the crossroads of when offset which is much much more cost effective than stone lithography came along and i believe this poster is an offset by the way fabulous yes. fabulous poster and it's interesting that in the poster world, sometimes it's the local significance that makes the poster. You know, it's so nice to have something. And and going back, Ruth Farnham, as I mentioned, she appeared in Sharon, I believe, Greg, is that correct? So it was in Sharon itself to speak on her tour. It's really nice to see a poster that's significant to a town. And this is a case where had it not been saved, this is the kind of thing no one would look at and go, oh, that's such a beautiful thing. I think I'll save it. It's really amazing that the music, the library has it and now can display it. You know, it's not, if, if you just found this and you didn't know you were in Sharon, it's not a poster of interest pretty much to anybody but Sharon. And it's so fabulous of interest to Sharon. It's great that the, the library has it. It was printed apparently quite locally is what Gretchen's research is in Millerton which is, again, understanding that prior to radio and TV, printing was a big thing. And if you think about it, every parade, every church social, every event would need a simple type poster like this. So there were printers everywhere who could do it. Very rare to see it exist to survive from 1918. Yeah, this was a personal favorite of mine. I. I uh... You know, if you're in Wyoming and you see a poster like that for somewhere in Pennsylvania, you just you wouldn't even look at it twice. But to be in Sharon, seeing a Sharon poster, I'm looking at it and I see the Cornwall Cornet Band and I think of the um, the tree lighting on the green and, you know, Scott Heth leading everyone with his trumpet and the where it says the patri is it patriotic addresses from the steps of town hall. It's the same town hall. It's the same building. Like you can, you can just visualize all of it. And even like, like you said, David, the it being printed in Millerton, it's like, okay, they probably just took the Millerton road back and forth. They were in the back of someone's pickup and it's everything about it. You can, you know, sort of make a connection. And that was 104 years ago. That's so to me, I just think that's super cool. And and I'm sure it must be the only one that survived because why would anyone keep it? It just it's just information, but it's, it's I think it's beautiful to all of us watching. Um, but it's a different kind of beauty. It it also makes me smile because the Cornwall Cornet band only makes me think of the music man, the musical. Yes. Now, <laughs> does anyone play the cornet anymore? You know. It's it's a fabulous it's a fabulous historic piece that I'm glad to see preserved for the, the library in the local town. I think maybe we should just read out loud the little ditty at the bottom because it's so great. I 
Oh, you 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 got muted, Gretchen. There we go. Sorry. Um, I just thought we should read out loud the um the little ditty at the bottom because it's so great. Litchfield is the county town. Canaan is quite sandy. Cornwall is a rocky town, but Sharon is the dandy. I think that's all how we feel about our town, isn't it? I wonder if every town had a little a little song or verse to um to go with it. It's pretty, and someone had to write that. You know, you just wonder who who got the job to write that, and and who knew enough about Cornwall, Litchfield, and Canaan to do that. And Cornwall right. still probably claimed to be a rocky town. That's right. <laughs> and, I mean, I don't know about just, it was just going to say just to think about all the people involved. If you read the whole poster, there were many, many people involved with those activities. You know, there was a parade, and there was a chorus, and there were. Um, Patriotic scenes were recreated and um, refreshments were served all afternoon. It's hard to imagine, you know, so many people coming together today to do something like that. It's literally many, many, many people. And this one is at the Historical Society for everyone to see now, so. That's great. All right, so we have one from Between the Wars. And again, Howard Chandler Christie, who, if we look back, was the very second poster we saw, Fighter by Bonds. Um, this is as between the wars, Will Rogers died in 1935, and the Will Rogers Memorial Fund was set up. I believe what I just learned tonight from Rich is it still exists and still supports certain causes. But classic, classic Christie imagery of patriotic woman with the portrait of, Christ, of, of, of Will Rogers. And he was huge. Like I, I don't think people realize that he was an absolute rock star in the '30s. You know, he live performances, movies, and most famous for his roping. And there he is, like preserved forever with um, his lasso. And um, there's great footage of him, like making little tiny uh, circles, like sort of six inches across, and roping things. And it's good fun. I can't figure out what's going on. It looks like there's a a pool toy behind the woman in the shape of the flag. I don't know what someone know what that might be. Is it just a is it a billowy flag or what's going on there? I think it's, it's a, just flag. a flag. It's just a flag. And okay. it's putting a wreath of laurel on Will Rogers. Yeah. Looks like it. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. It's got the laurel. All right, here we go. And this is a great example of the sudden change to a very militaristic pop, pop, a posture. If you look at this and the next few posters coming up, and you'll see bombs, you'll see bombs, you'll see bombs, you'll see explosions, you'll see much more of the militaristic imagery created not by fine artists, but by commercial graphics department, frequently internally in the army. Now, that's not to say there wasn't some crossover we all know Rockwell's famous for Freedom's posters, but those were not originally done as posters. They weren't commissioned as posters. They were they were so beloved after they appeared in the magazine that they became posters. Um, in World War II, and as Gretchen mentioned, the book that I have out has 635 posters, which sounds like a lot until you consider that the Museum of Modern Art had a poster competition. It alone had 2,400 submissions. Um, World War II, I would have to guess based on my 30 years of business, there's 10, 20,000 distinct posters that were printed. Every corporation, Ford Motors, General Motors, all of the alcoholic companies printed posters. Every division of the military printed posters. So they still were a mass communication form in the United States. But as you go through these, you'll see a very different feel and look to the World War I patriotism excuse me, to the World War II patriotism through militaristic um, imagery. And David, is it true that a lot of the World War II poster artists were a lot of sort of expat German Jews, Eastern Europeans, Russians, guys that came over after the First World War and, you know, became great designers and architects and all sorts of other things, but very specifically designers, where in the First World War, there was a lot of just Americans and Brits doing that sort right. of look. I, 
again, understanding the huge quantity, I don't know that you can quantify it as a lot. Jean Carlu was a French architect who fled and did posters. Um, e. McKnight Calfer was actually an American born in Colorado, went to Europe, studied in Europe, was doing work for the British Underground and like, British Under Railroad, not military underground. Um, in 1910, 20, he moved back and did a lot of war posters. Um, Boris Bertibashev um, and Sean, a lot of them were immigrants who had great feelings for the war cause. Conservation. This becomes a really interesting, and again, the fat one also becomes an interesting question. World War I, we saw a lot of food conservation posters. World War II, we saw a lot of conservation posters um, for food, energy, transportation that we talk about here. And the question that's been raised, and I've read significantly about in World War I, there was no need for conservation. The country could produce significant quantities of food, but they wanted to make people feel participatory in the work cause, particularly immigrants. World War II, I, I, my understanding is that it was slightly different. There was need for metal. There was need for to conserve energy. There was need to do conservation to allow the companies to build aircraft, bombers, ships, tanks. Uh, so again, the distinction between World War I and World War II comes down to patriotism and being part of pride of your country versus the militaristic, we need bombers, we need airplanes. Ford Motors, for instance, shut down the car lines, became the largest producer of tanks and airplanes almost overnight using Henry Ford's knowledge of how to make things happen in a, on, a, on a production line. I remember uh, when, I guess, in the early days of COVID, when people needed hand sanitizer and a lot of the liquor companies started making it and bottling it. And the first thing I thought of was exactly what you said, David, is back in the day when, um, was it, who was the company that was making refrigerators? And then they were suddenly making tanks and stuff. I think you just, if you had the machinery, you just did what you had to. And COVID was not World War II, but there was definitely a, a worldwide need and people just stepped up and said, right, we're going to do this now. And it was nice to see. It is nice to see. But there was a need in World War II for metal. There was a need for, for all sorts of things like that that really didn't exist in World War I in the same way. Okay. Again, compare this to the posters from World War I. We have the same iconography, we have the flag, but here we have bombs bursting in air and not in a particularly positive light. The sky is black, the, the guns are all firing. Again, it's, it's militarism versus patriotism. And that's not a bad thing, that's just, a, that's just an explanation of the propaganda we're seeing. There was, a, there was some problems in World War II that definitely needed to be addressed and what was done had to be done. It was just a way of getting the point across that, you know, United we're strong, United will win. Well, part of that strength is in bombs. His name's probably Johnny, Johnny right? It is interesting how he looks like he's filthy and stinks and sweating and bloody. Like he looks like a proper soldier. He's not marching off and smiling back at his mother. Um, there's a whole other vibe, just like you were saying the iconography with the guns, the, the, the men in this case look very different. And his weapon looks pretty menacing. You know, that bayonet is front and center. Again, think of the fighter by Bond is the second poster we looked at by Christie. Yeah, all the soldiers in the bottom, they were much less important as percentage of the photo of the poster. They were small at the bottom. The woman was there with her flag. This is a much more militaristic image. But as, as you described him, he's filthy. He's been out trenches for who knows how long, but he's still saying he's just begun to fight. He's not given up. And the list on the, the bottom right is almost like a 
um, notches on the end of a gun or, in a, you know, a whiskey bottle or something like we've done this, 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 and this, and, you know, just keep throwing it at us and we're going to keep knocking you back. And it is like a sort of greatest hits. I don't know if that was, was it, did they do that in world war one at all? Was there anything like that? Or was it all just about the hun and leave it at that? Yeah, no, it, it's just such a different visual, such a more, you know, military. In, in World War One, I, I think it was the British, and, and you didn't, the library didn't get any British posters, but the British, in their proper way, the posters were titled like, Daddy, what did you do in the Great War? Uh, Mother right. sends your sons, but it was always the pretty picture back home. It was not the soldier, who clearly is just dug out of the trenches or just hopped off the ship in the land of there is your heart. Next. How much more? So this harkens back more to the World War One kind of, you know, help feed. My understanding, again, is food really was never an issue. There was plenty of food. It was, it was metal and things like that. But they wanted you to feel part of the cause. They wanted you to feel pride. And what you were doing, pride in supporting this war effort, which cost you more than it could have cost your son, your brother, could have cost you everything. But but you had to get people to understand and be participatory in the cause. And the men weren't there to milk the cow and you know pick the vegetables, but it wasn't it was not a dire food shortage at home. It was more of a cause to be to promote it. So, you know, I can't think of any World War, I can't think of any World War One poster that has a um, injured or, or dead soldier. It's very, very graphic, very graphic compared to anything in World War One. And understand 1945, I'm not quite sure when in 1945 it was. But this is after VE Day. So now we've got to get to Tokyo and end the Pacific War. Again, the World War II posters, we really haven't seen much, much by way of just, you know, other than the last one of the, of the, of the um, farming, we're seeing the, the effects of the war, what we need to do, not how people just feel pride in what's going on. There wasn't much to be proud of in World War II. Next. Don't travel. Common theme in World War II posters. Is there another? Oh, yeah. And again, I was mentioning to Gretchen, um, I've seen a lot of posters for different states, different small areas that are like this. And it's fabulous to see them preserved. It's not common. This isn't the kind of thing that, as Darren mentioned, oh, if this turned up in a box in California somewhere, which is pitch it. It's fabulous to have it where it belongs back in Connecticut talking about you know, the local needs and where you can go get involved. So I've seen comparable things for various states um, and it's nice to see it where, it where it should be. Next, same with this, it's great to see. And, and this was, as we talked about the World War I Sharon poster, this was a pretty quick and easy kind of printing. It could be done locally. And it's not, it, it didn't require an artist. So these were, these were printed locally everywhere and very few exist. It's really nice to see it saved in Sharon, which if we think even in the forties was much more of a farming community than I assume it is now. Next. I think that brings us to the end of these. Oh no, we have the children's book week. I forgot. Now we're getting the book week posters. I love the book week posters. Starting in 1926, 
Children's Book Council every year produced a poster promoting Children's Book Week. Um, and why these were in, one has to assume that different people gave the war poster collections at some point in history and time to the library. The Book Week posters were supplied to each library. It's fabulous to see them uh, survive. There, these were done each year by an important children's book illustrator. So there is a book that I hope the library has. If not, they should get one. It's called 100 Years of Children. There we go. 73 years. That with that, I think there's a newer edition, by the way. I think there's now 100 Years of Children's Book Week poster. Yes. Out. I have the 75. There is a right. hundred and Leonard yeah. Marcus spoke to us about them uh -huh. uh, a few weeks ago. So, yep. so you see him smiling. This is a fabulous collection of posters, each one done by a prominent children's book illustrator. So it runs the gamut of just beautiful children's book posters by children's book illustrators. If you wanna flip through these back and forth a little bit, I think you've got them chronological, but you'll see some of the names um, big, big name children's book illustrators and fabulous, fabulous illustrations. It's a nice collection that hopefully the library at some point can hang it as a group all at one at a time. And if you look through from the very earliest to the latest, it just shows not only the changes in illustration imagery, but this is a perfect example. Go back one second. The changes in you can see the clothing, the furniture, the hairstyles in every possible way over a hundred years. It shows you, it's, it's, a, it's a snapshot of the world through children's books. And go back forward now to the Maurice Sendak. These are all huge name. Maurice Sendak did that 1960, very, fairly early in his career. So they were able to get massively important children's book illustrators. There's a Dr. Seuss, there's Bob, uh, anybody and everybody they got them to do a children's book poster. Um, and they were mailed to the library. Uh, I, I promise Gretchen and I will, I'll send her a few ones that I have some that you don't have that I've got my inventory to add to the collection. Is that the latest one you have, the last one you have in, the, in your photos? Uh, it's the last one I have here. We have 1961 as well. So we had right. a, we must have had an amazing unsung hero at the library, a wonderful children's librarian who worked from, you know, the late 40s or early 50s to the early 60s, and she saved all of them. Right. The sad part is until about three years ago, they actually printed and mailed them. And you could ask them to send you one. Um, and then at the beginning of COVID, they stopped producing them. And now you have to get a PDF file and you can print your own. It does not have the same experiential value. And unfortunately, I fear it does not have the same historic value and it won't be saved. It's changed a great deal. The good part was they did revert to printing them this year and mail them out again. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that was one of those many COVID related changes. Um, but, but there's something very viscerally different to having a physical piece of paper with it printed than printing your out on a printing your own out from a PDF. It's never it's never going to be the same size. These are all um, uh, seventeen. I'm trying to think of the size. Seventeen by twenty two. So they're bigger than most people can print. They're fab. They're well printed, and they're just nice to see them as a group. So you've got what nineteen of them hmm. from nineteen forty on. This year. Um... Children's Book Week was celebrated twice. They have a spring and now a fall. So they're trying to bring it back. We even have a booklet from the mid forties or mid late forties um, that they sent out. And it's, you know, they'd never do this today but it's 60 pages long with little essays by all these well-known educators and publishers and um, significant That's people talking about why um, literacy is important, why books are important for children with okay. tips on how to engage children and what to do in the library to celebrate these things. So it was really, really amazing. And, and some of, a couple of ours, the dates are covered over and they just celebrated it a different week. Um, you know, they changed it. <laughs> we'll, we'll do our book week a different week. As so. Gretchen mentioned, we lived in Sharon in 1990, 
2005 to 2001 when my kids were very young and we went to the library for book reading on a regular basis. That's you know, great. We remember it well. And I hate to admit it, I can't remember who the children's librarian was then, but she read fabulously. Probably Miss Kathy, right? Probably Kathy, yep. Who's yeah. still, at, still at the library at the circular desk. Yeah. Yep. She That's was funny. serving for my kids. They also did um, the, what is it called? Is it just, is it story time? What do you guys call when all the kids come? Yeah, story time. Sort of, I guess three, my daughter was born in Sharon. Our son was a year when we moved up. So until they were, I don't know, six or seven or eight, until they rebelled and didn't want to go to story time. But yeah, like clockwork every week. Yep. That's great. And I think that brings us to the end. So I hope people have lots of questions. Um, we'll stop that. I was going to just say, uh, Gretchen, there's a, Bev has a question asking if there were posters that were so damaged that they could not be conserved. Um, it's amazing. Uh, there's a conservationist down in um, uh, uh, Stanford that David introduced me to uh, called Poster Conservation Incorporated. And I, it was really fun. I took a bunch of the posters down there and I got to see what they do in their studio and they did amazing things to them. They can fill in the holes with new paper. Um, they're backed on, they call it linen, but David, it's actually canvas. Is that right? So so I, I need I need to correct you because it's an important distinction. The they, don't with, right, they don't fill it with new paper. Okay. They have bins and bins and bins of vintage scrap. Wow. And if I have a poster that's garbage, that is too bad for a store. We give it to them and they have bins sorted by color, the type of printing, and they literally will find a piece of paper. They'll spend whatever time to find the piece of paper that matches the loss. So it really is replacing it with the same paper as is missing. Um, and yes, it's called linen backing, but it hasn't been linen probably since World War One. they use canvas. So they'll stretch for a piece of canvas as in a painting, put down a sheet of acid-free paper, and then lay the poster down using an acid-free wheat paste, which then gives them a surface to work from. If you think back to some of the World War II posters we just saw, many of those were folded. And the photos you are seeing are before they were back. Then backing will all but mitigate the fold lines. If there's losses, as Gretchen mentioned, they can piece them in and touch them up as necessary. Bear in mind, these were ephemeral. They weren't meant to survive. There's no sin in restoring a poster. That's how they were intended to be used. They were intended to be pasted up. And it's better to preserve it than lose it. Yeah, but even like the little thumbtack holes disappear. Um, the big, the big huge poster we showed you first that's five feet wide, the um, house poster um, had creases in it and they virtually disappeared. It's it's incredibly beautiful. It's amazing. It was interesting to go down there and see all the the stuff that she was working on too in her studio. Are there any other questions? Feel free, you can um, turn your mic on and ask directly, that's fine. What I was going to ask, and I'm a, trust, a trustee of the library and very... Oh, you're muted, Lorna. Lorna Edmondson, I'm a trustee of the library and very interested also in how we take care of these and, and use them. Is there, um, are they likely to deteriorate over time? Should, are they, how, Gretchen, you maybe can know this already, of course, but how are we framing them? Is it with particular kind of glass or surfaces that will protect them or are they just going to deteriorate ultimately? We chose to, uh, the ones that have been framed so far, we have a museum grade acrylic that's mm -hmm. on them, um, right. that's lighter. Um, but I think they're fairly well preserved in there. Isn't that right, David? Un understanding that we have posters, these are the World War II, one posters are over hundred years old. Once back, they should not degrade in any way, shape or form, as long as you've got UV protection. That is the biggest detriment, again, massive humidity, you have a water damage, things like that. But in terms of 
if they're properly framed, they're good to go for many, many, many years. So we were just very fortunate that that unknown drawer uh, that never got opened had the temperature and climate conditions that were right for, for preserving posters. Is that it? To a certain extent, yes. I mean, fortunately, <laughs> well, I go, I go to France regularly and it's a miracle that things will be in a damp, moist cave. They call yes. it a cough, a basement for years. And once you've stabilized it, you're okay. I've brought posters out of the deep south that have been in attics for years and so dry, you can't even unroll them. And then it'll go to the conservators who have to humidify them before they can unroll it. Wow. Once they're stabilized, paper is very forgiving. Paper is really forgiving. What can't be restored is light damage, sunburn, fading. But, but you are fortunate as Grant mentioned, the bigger posters, what I found in many, many collections is the larger the poster is, it will be more damaged. And then all the other things will be rolled up inside and the edges of the big one will be beat up and the small ones will have been protected by the big one, which is a good thing. But your collection, for the most part, was in fabulous condition. Folds are always there in World War II. The Book Week posters were always folded in four for mailing. That's not a sin. And it's not insurmountable. I found myself thinking about the, um, you point out the difference in the kind of messages between World War I and World War II and World War I kind of focusing on, you know, the beauty of patriotism and drawing together with World War II being so much more grim and wondering how much of it's really just a factor of communications like during World War I there were certainly some journalists around, journalists involved, but there wasn't nearly the um, uh, people in, the, in this country didn't have their eyes on the ground the way they did during World War II when there was so much more, communication was so much more sophisticated. And I wonder if it was really just the, the realism, the, the sense of the realism is so much more effective in terms of trying to, you know, um, scare people into thinking we need to get this over as opposed to the softer message of World War One. I. I mean, maybe that's a long way of asking a question that's not very clear anyway, but. No, it was, it was very clear. I wonder if you're, I, and then I don't know the answer, I wonder if you're correct, that by World War Two, you had radio, you had Walter Winchell calling in from the front. Mm. You knew what was going on. Yes, you had the gas attack to World War One, and you knew things like that, but it still was a very different sensibility. You didn't have the horrors of World War One showing up you didn't have Franklin Roosevelt speaking as he did the day after Pearl Harbor with images in the newspaper. So it's, it's a very plausible theory that part of it is you were able to see the horrors. So the propaganda messages became more horrible in kind. Yeah. If, if that's what I think you were asking. Yeah, yeah, no, that was what I was asking. And to some extent, not to make, not to go too far with the analogy, but posters were a little bit of the internet of the day in terms of messages being sprinkled around for public you know um consumption 100 percent 100 percent correct and wondering if, if in addition to libraries and other public buildings you know where else would these kind of posters have shown up i mean in courthouses and town halls and that that's, sort of thing? that's a fabulous question so i have a collection i've put together and i've shown it to darren over about 30 years of photos of posters in use and right now, we all think of posters as these bijous, these art objects, just like the one behind me yeah. in a nice frame. They were meant to be used. They were meant to be pasted on walls. They were meant to be used in train stations. They were meant to be used in bond drives. I've seen them literally pasted on the sides of cars while they drove around doing bond drives. They were used one of the most common uses of World War II posters. And the library doesn't have any examples of this. Seagram's Distillery, every other distillery published posters to be used in bars. Why? What happens in a bar? Loose lips sink ships. And there's every single distiller did a series of posters that said those exact words, loose lips drink, sink ships, things like that, and talked about don't drink and talk. Um, so they were used in bars, they were used in post office, they were used on bond drives. I've got a photo of a prominent actress in World War II going out on a tour, pasted to the side of her suitcase was a Bond poster. They also were used on the front. I've got malaria posters in the tropics. 
catering to the soldiers, talking about sleep under a tent, uh, net. I've got VD posters. VD was a massive, massive, massive story. Woodrow Wilson said in 1921, if we could have cured World War I, and if we could have cured VD, World War I would have ended a year sooner. At the height of World War I, 15% of all soldiers, 15, one in six soldiers was off the front being treated for VD. So posters were everywhere trying to stop that. That was a huge story. They were in every factory, Ford Motors, GM printed uh, posters. They were everywhere. Social control. Yeah. Wow. Huh. And, and, and it, but it went on, right? I mean, when did it really, did it, it clearly went into the 50s. But Posters? Yeah. Posters still exist on bus stops in New York. They're now changing. Now we're seeing the digital where it'll change so you can change right, it. Right. Posters are still being printed. There are still some very great campaigns done. Uh, the iPod campaign, for instance, is one of the most significant posters. Yves Saint Laurent did an opium poster that made national, world global news. So they're still there, just not. We now have, as you well said, the internet. They're not the same importance as they were in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and it went downhill from there. But neither is how many people on this Zoom meeting, who watches the nightly news anymore? It's not where we get our news. How many people here have a subscription? I have a subscription to the New York Times, but it's digital. When's the last time we saw a physical paper? Things change, and we're talking about a printed paper, a poster, a printed poster. It's not, it's, it's, they're just not that much anymore. It's a dying art form. And what about the value of some of these posters, um, uh, David? Uh, the is there a market? For, poster? Yes. Is there a market for some of these um, less common ones? There, there's, there, there's, there's a very, very broad range in the value of posters. The range of, you know, of propaganda posters from World War One can be from as little as twenty or thirty dollars to as much as twenty-five thousand dollars for one poster. And it really is the subject matter, the artist, the rarity, um, all of the above. World War Two posters the same. There's there's some that are worth very 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 little, and some that are worth in the thousands. Any other questions for our, our guests this evening? Um, somebody asked, did you discover any posters using photography? The Ruth Farnham is a photo illustration. Was that a colorized photo? That it's a photo, yeah, it's a photo illustration. I'm trying to think of any other ones. Um, we, we've just begun to fight. I believe is taken from a photo. The soldier with the bayoneted rifle, I believe, is taken from an image. One of the most famous World War II posters, which you don't have, is the illustration, the photo of Iwo Jima, the soldiers raising the flag on Iwo Jima. So we did start to see World War I, not that many. World War II, we do see quite a number that use photography versus, versus um, illustration. And we see a number of photo illustrations where it's sort of a photo montage photography and illustration photography put into an illustration photography alongside an illustration but the two that i believe you have are the are the ruth farnham and the soldier which is truly illustrated but comes from a famous photo so you collect all kinds of posters david i believe is that right all i, I oh. deal in i deal in posters on my website there's about twenty eight thousand discrete posters um, I specialize what I what I love and care about, as Darren will tell you, is historical documentation. So we, we, I've written various articles and books on propaganda and propaganda posters. Um, I have a very large collection of Chinese cultural revolution posters. I've been going to China for long enough when you can actually find them. Um, I have a large collection of both sides, protest posters, you know, anti-government posters. It's, it's the historical documentation that we care about. And it's, as I was saying, it's fabulous that you've got those sharing specific pieces because they're so uncommon that they were preserved. 
I was in the Soviet Union in 1984 in college and I bought or, you know, got at, at one of the state stores, I got a bunch of the posters. So I have some great, you know, communist ones, but they're pretty interesting. There's a question here um, from Patricia who says, my father, John Paul Pennebaker did war bond post photo posters. I know the name Pennebaker. I'd love to see Paul what he did. Mm -hmm. oh. Gotta look into him. Yeah, that's great. And Darren, you your auction house sometimes um, sells posters, that's right, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, we actually, um, we sell them in my department in books and manuscripts. We also sell them in our modern contemporary art department. Um, it's sort of what um, we wonder, or we, sorry, we think about who the end user is going to be. So sometimes um, there'll be a poster in one of my sales that you wouldn't think should be and vice versa. It's always to the best end. They usually end up in my department, but also depending on the era, if you're talking about like early 20th, late 19th century oversized French posters, they tend to be in a completely different department because they're, they're art, they're not posters. Um, but yeah, we handle them all the time. And it's great because we get to see a, a wide spectrum. It's, it's how David and I met was through posters and then found out that we lived, you know, two miles from each other and Sharon for years. <laughs> and I, you know, he was in Delaware, I was in, in Philadelphia. So it's funny how far you have to go to find something that's right next to you. <laughs> Is there a new museum in, in the city, the Museum of the Poster or something? Um, New York City Poster House. Poster House opened about five years ago in New York City. Fabulous museum um, that has a really, really great exhibit right now if anyone's interested on Air India posters, um, which is this wonderful series that's unique to all of the airlines. And they rotate it through, it's on 23rd Street. Good, good little museum here in the city. Go visit Poster House. Sounds good time for a field trip. Great. All right. Well, we're at eight o'clock. We have time for another question or two if anybody has them while we have the, the chance. Any other comments? Um, if not, I encourage you all to stop by the Historical Society. I think they're open Wednesday through Saturday from 10, uh, from I think Wednesday through Friday from 10 to 4 and on Saturday maybe from about 10 to 2. And you can go right in. They have an opening this um, Saturday for a new exhibit in the front part of the museum. And our small collection is in the um, lobby and in what they call the gallery. So you can go in anytime it's open to take a look. And they'll be there until uh, just before Christmas. And then they'll be stashed away for a few months. And then they will make their debut in their beautiful new home. So I hope you'll have a chance to see them. So forward to that. It was very, very interesting. Very interesting. Thank you, Darren and David. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Darren. Well, very good job. Have and, a good uh, night. Well done. Come back, come back to Sharon sometime, David, and we'll we'll uh, have you at the library. And Darren also come back to Sharon. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, at every chance I get, Nancy, trust me, every chance I get, sometimes it's only for two hours, but I make sure I get to the market and I make okay. sure I get to town hall. So yeah, okay. I'll sometimes make sure I honk when I drive past. Okay. So yes, that's right. Sometimes we get to see him. Thank you all so much. Yep. Have a good night. Thank Take you. care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.